Jones, how many here are economics majors? Yep, none of you. <laughs> um, it's funny because economics actually lends very well to marketing, but not many people that are economics majors go into marketing. Um, um, th there's several reasons why. First, it's, economics is the science of decision making, and second, we learn how to conduct market research and <clears throat> how to interpret data and apply that to business practices. But then we also learn about the behavioral side, we learn the human side of decision making, why someone would buy one product instead of another. I'm also the creator and host of a podcast called Behavioral Economics and Marketing. In this podcast, I take behavioral economics concepts and break it down into easy to understand uh, terms and then apply it to marketing. And that's kind of like what I'm gonna do today. I'm excited because I'm starting getting ready to launch season five of my podcast. It is called Lessons from the Fire, where I'll talk about how natural disasters affect people and then how you can apply that to not just marketing during and after natural disasters, but um, marketing in general. Uh, yep, my podcast is on every, every platform possible. I have over 30,000 monthly listeners. And um, if you like what I talk about, you'll like that. I also have 15 years of experience across the four P's of marketing, product, place, uh, price, and promotion. And I've done a lot of consulting in and out of many industries, but the most of my experience is in the travel industry. And when I, um, when I say that I work in the travel industry, I either get one or two different responses. The first is, oh, that must be so easy because everybody loves to travel. On the other end of the spectrum, people say, well, that's such a shame that the industry is dying. But it's funny because the last three months were the three highest grossing months in the history of my, my 30 year history of my company. And prior to COVID, I started at a um, a Japan tour operator that uh, six months into the year. And the one thing about travel is that 40 to 60% of our sales come in the first three months of the year. But when I started, we were down by millions of dollars. And by the end of the year, we finished 30% year over year growth. And that's the type of growth that I bring to every situation. And the reason why is that behavioral economics. That's my key differentiating factor. And it's something that you can easily do too. So getting started, um, what is behavioral economics? And to understand what behavioral economics is, you've got to understand what traditional economics is. And traditional economics is defined as a social science and branch of knowledge concerned chiefly with description and analysis of production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services, as well as the transfer of wealth. Um, economists, or another standard definition is the one here, uh, we study how people allocate their limited resources to satisfy their nearly unlimited wants, and that is marketing. Um, economists study how decisions are made on a micro and macro level, everything from individuals to companies or organizations, all the way up to uh, governments and societies and world leaders. However, traditional economics proceeds as if everyone is homo economics, and this means that we are rationally self-interested decision makers. We are acutely aware of all the opportunities and options in the environment and their expected payoff. A decision maker that strives to maximize the benefits received and each course of action while minimizing the costs. So where does traditional economics fall short? Have you ever purchased an item just to find it cheaper down the road? Or have you purchased a gallon of milk at the store and knowing fully well that it is twice the prices of the grocery store? Or what about savings? Is there an expensive item that you would like to purchase, like a, a vacation or a home or a car, but you would have to save up to do it? And yet, you spend all of your money on items such as fancy dinners or expensive clothes and don't actually save. 
And the truth is, is that we're not always rational, self-interested decision makers. We don't always maximize benefits and minimize costs. We make decisions under uncertainty with insufficient knowledge, feedback, and bounded rationality. We sometimes lack self-control. Our preferences change, often how, on how the decision and the options are presented. In, in behavioral economics, it's called framing. Uh, humans are irrational, and that is where behavioral economics steps in. Behavioral economics is defined, is defined as the incorporation of the study of psychology into the analysis of, analysis of the decision making behind an economic outcome to capture a wider range of human motivations than the rational agent model alone affords. For example, through behavioral economics, we can study and analyze the facts that lead up to a consumer buying one product instead of another, or just walking away from the sale altogether. <clears throat> so to, to jump into the meat of this, uh, earlier this month I was in Mallorca, uh, it's a fabulous island off the coast of Spain, and I was there for business. We were at the airport in Mallorca flying from Mallorca to Menorca, the next island over, and I was talking to one of the travel agents that was also on this business trip with me, and she said, so tell me about your podcast, and I said, it's called Behavioral Economics and Marketing. And she's like, what? And I said, it's called behavioral economics and marketing. And she's like, oh, that sounds awful. You need a better title than that. I said, well, I think it's pretty good because it says exactly what I do. And she's like, so tell me about uh, your podcast. Tell me about what you talk about. And so I said, well, my latest episode was called Dual Process Theory on Customer Journey Optimization. I said, well, what, what that means is dual process theory is this idea that we, as humans, either think in one or two different ways. There's system one, this is the quick knee-jerk reactions, this is uh, driving home from, from work, going the same way you always go, this is buying a tube of toothpaste at the store, or ordering a pizza online. Whereas system two thinking, that's that's a little bit more in depth, that requires a little bit more effort. This is solving a math problem, uh, mountain driving, or parallel parking. And your system one thinker, this is the this is the customer who comes to you year after year and buys that same Mexican resort vacation. And she said, or they come every year and they buy the same cruise on the same cruise ship. And I said, absolutely, that's exactly what it is. Your system two buyer is the one that will uh, do a lot more research. They will think about their product, they'll, they'll analyze it, they'll look at different competitors. Um, before I move on, I do want to put the reference in here. Uh, so, famous Nobel Prize in winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman, along with Amos Tversky, coined and popularized the concept of dual process theory. If you want to learn more about it, there are a ton of academic papers, but there's also a very famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay, and onto the customer journey part of this. How many of you use customer journeys? Okay, and how many of you use marketing funnels? Okay. Uh, so this is a very popular term, and that's why it's a crash course. So the customer journey is defined as a complete sum of experiences and interactions, as well as the path of sequential steps that a customer goes through with your company, product, or service. And the customer journey goes beyond user experience to document the full experience of being your customer. And why are they important? So according to McKinsey and Co, Across industries, performance on journeys is substantially more strongly correlated with customer satisfaction than performance on touch points, and performance on journeys is significantly more strongly correlated with business outcomes such as revenue, churn, and purchase. And what does that actually mean? There's benefits throughout creating a customer journey and optimizing it, including clarifying your channel performance, spotting bottlenecks, seeing significant successes. Understanding customer needs, improving decision making, improving customer experience, how to build customer engagement through sales and conversion rates, 
increased repeat referral business, and the list goes on and on. Okay, and so one really great example, one of the world's uh, most popular audio streaming services, Spotify, uh, wanted to improve the music sharing experience for their customers. So they hired a market research professional who created a customer journey map to, to determine where that feature fits in with the entire customer experience. They mapped out from the moment that a customer opened the app all the way through to the point where they liked uh, a song that one of their friends had shared. Uh, they used data research and customer surveys and mapped out what a customer was doing and then what they were thinking and feeling and what their motivations were at each step. And in this, they were able to identify and address customer pain points. The, the Spotify customer journey map is excellent because it identifies key areas of customer engagement, takes into account customer behavior, and has the goal of making the customer experience as enjoyable as possible. Uh, companies across industries have adopted the customer journey mapping to improve user experience and directly impact the conversion rates of sales. Okay, and customer journey stages. Every marketing professional may use different number of stages. They might call them by different things, but researchers have identified six common stages of the customer journey. So awareness, evaluation, consideration, purchase, retention, and advocacy. And one of the key things here, I wanted to, to stop for a minute and look at this because your marketing funnel generally stops at purchase. And customer journey um, adds on that retention and advocacy stage. Um, the purchase part of the funnel is actually the most expensive place to lose your customers. And so that might be a place where you want to put a lot of attention in but the retention and advocacy stage is also really important because it's the least expensive way to, to increase your sales. Um, but you might have your purchase, retention, and advocacy all figured out. You might have anybody who comes in the door, they purchase, they love it, they share it with their friends. So you might spot by doing this customer journey map that you might spot that the awareness stage is really where you need to, to put your effort. So just for that fact, mapping out your customer journey will help you to understand where you need to put your efforts, where people are dropping out, and um, what else you can do. Okay, and then personas. The development of your personas are, are very strongly important for your customer journey optimization. Um, so the first thing you do is you have to conduct research. This could be surveys, focus groups, customer interviews, user testing, A-B testing, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to point out as an economist that this is a crucial part of the customer journey mapping process. And if you are going to hire a marketing professional, this is where I would, I would hire them. Uh, the reason why is because novice marketing professionals can make key mistakes in market research including conducting the wrong type of research, hand-selecting their sample, discarding results for any reason, asking leading questions, and the list goes on. There's so many places where that market research can fall down. And the bottom line is your customer journey map will be only as good as your research and data that supports it. Starting with sound research is the key to good customer journey maps. And I also want to add in that Anywhere else along the line, as you're creating the map and as you're implementing it, you can learn from what's going on and tweak and change it, but it's that, that market research that's the core of it, and it's so important you start on a good, solid ground. Okay, so once you've conducted your research, you want to profile your personas, outline their goals, find common links between customers to develop those strong personas. And you may choose only a few personas to focus on. A few common ones include ideal customers, realistic customers, or negative personas. These illustrate the type of customer who is unlikely to buy. And another really key thing that you can be looking at is whether or not your customer is in system one or system two when they purchase. And is that what you want them ideally in as well? Do you want them thinking 
strongly about your product and, and comparing it to the competitors, or do you want them to quickly pick up the, your brand of toothpaste on the shelf? And with this, timing is everything. So sometimes you want your customer to be in system one, sometimes system two. Sometimes you want them in system one for half of the journey and then nudge them to system two. You may want them in system one through purchase, but then system two for retention and advocacy. Or you may want them in system two through consideration and then ease them to system one for purchase. For example, if you are a toothpaste company, you may want your customers in system one, a systematic process that they don't really have to think about. But what if you are targeting customers of your competitor? Then you clearly want them in system two through consideration and then nudge them to system one for purchase. In this time is everything, every persona, every product is going to be different. And so let's talk about how to nudge someone from system two into system one. And again, just to go over what system one thinking is, is that quick knee-jerk reaction is uh, buying to a toothpaste, ordering a pizza online. It's not something that they really think that much about. You want to make it very simple. You want to ask quick yes-no questions uh, or have them ask that of themselves based on what you're putting out there. Your remarketing should be repetitive. You should be using the same imagery, the same copy, the same thoughts. It should look very much the same as you continue to, to put the same imagery in front of them. You want your imagery to be iconic. For example, in the travel industry, I might put a, a Eiffel Tower picture up because this is an iconic site. People immediately recognize it. They know exactly where it is and, and they can imagine themselves in there. You don't want to overcomplicate. You want everything to be very simplistic. Your imagery, your copy, your font, your colors, all of it to be very simple. You want it to be um, sequential, if this, then this. So if, if you like Paris, you might like London. You don't necessarily want to say, if you like Paris, you might like Budapest, even though they probably would. Uh, you want to present your options very simply. Uh, three options at most is what I like. You want these simply differentiated price type of benefits. Uh, you're going to really only promote one part of that. You're not going to say, this is this and this price and these benefits and you want to make it very simple so that it's a quick yes no for them for each of those options if you really do need to offer more uh, complexity to it you start with those three options once they pick one you bring them into the next layer and you layer options on top of it yes no options would, would work the best at that do they want that upgrade do they want the um, the insurance with it, that type of thing. Um, bundling for uh, nudging into system one does work really well. On my podcast, I did give this example of when you work, when you walk into the grocery store in the middle of the summer, you'll see a nice display of s'mores stuff. You'll see the marshmallows, the chocolate, the graham crackers. And this is a simple bundling thing. It's a simple yes, no, yes, I want s'mores, no, I don't. It has one brand up there, it doesn't have a store brand, it doesn't have a lot of options. And usually people walk in, they see it, and they might not have any interest in buying stores, but they do anyway. A system two thinker might walk in, see that s'mores uh, bundle there, and say, well, I want that, but I want the store brand, or I want a different brand, or, you know, add-ons, or whatever. So that's that would be a system one type of thing, a nice, simple, all-together thing. Uh, you also want an ultra segment in system one. You don't want to include any irrelevant info. Your call to action should be the only message that's in there. Um, you don't want to overcomplicate. You know, for example, in um, travel, I'm going to, if someone says they're interested in Paris, I'm only sending them Paris information. I'm not sending them. 50 different other options as well. And I, I believe that in system one, system two, ultra segmenting is always important. You never want to overcomplicate and overwhelm. Going on to system two, system two thinking are the, the muscles. And this is 
when you really, really think about what you're, you're buying, you're, you're comparing different competitors, different pricing, different bundles. Uh, in system two, you can do bundling at, uh, as well, but timing is everything again. In, in system one, you generally would put your bundling at, at the purchase stage when people are getting ready to purchase. Okay, they've already they've already looked at your product, they've already decided on your company. Then you give them the, the options of the bundles. In system two, thinking if you're trying to nudge them into it, you might put this, the bundling right up at the front. You want to make them thinking about their product. You're, they're comparing your product with others, and they can see different options that you can include it. Also, when you're bundling, you can use bundling to merge people into system two. In this more example, you would put different options and different add-ons. You might put white chocolate, and, and as well as the, the regular chocolate. You might put dark chocolate. You might put bananas there. You can add more options for system two thinkers, and layers of options. And options can be more varied. Uh, I still think that. You don't want to have choice overload, so you don't want them to, to just walk away from the sale. So not too many options still, or at least structured in a way that they can easily scan through it. But um, having more options can nudge people into system two thinking. Your remarketing can be unique in system two. You can have um, not just the same images, you might want to put different types of images out. Ultra segmenting, though I think it's always important to segment and, and make sure you're sending the right message to the right person at the right time, it's not as necessary in system two. Um, so one example that I like to give is from Old Navy. They often will send a you know, email marketing that says $10 shorts and that's like the, the subject line. You get into the email and you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to see that system. Or to see that, so um, to see the shorts, there's everything else in the way. This is a system two technique. They want you to get thinking not just about the shorts, but about all the other things. Uh, somebody else, another speaker, mentioned about putting all the, the good deals in the back of the store. It's the same thing. This is system two thinking. Your imagery is more experiential than system two. You might not put the Eiffel Tower, but you might put someone eating a uh, a croissant and drinking coffee at a cafe with cobblestone streets in Paris. Um, for your toothpaste example, you would have what it's like to experience that, you know, your first kiss after brushing your teeth or something like that. You might not put the picture of the product. <clears throat> also, in, in travel, food pictures work really well for system two. Okay, so we've talked about the marketing model. We've talked about how the um, customer journey is, adds on those two extra steps and also adds on other nuances as well, their motivations, what people are thinking, what they're feeling. I like to think of things in the loop framework. And so the loop framework actually comes from product development, but I have adopted this for uh, my, my marketing as well as my professional and personal development. So with the loop framework, you start with data. You analyze the data, you make a plan, you implement it, and you learn from that data. And out of that, you get new data. And then you analyze it, you plan, you implement, and it goes around and around in loops. Um, this is really important in my, uh, in my industry because people travel because their kids are on vacation, it's summer vacation, it's spring break, they travel because it's a birthday or an anniversary. They travel basically at the same time every year. It's a very cyclical buying pattern. So if they do fall out of my funnel this year, they can learn from it. Or if they if they stay in that funnel and they purchase, the next year I can make them go through that funnel quicker because I've learned from the previous loop. And so this works with all kinds of cyclical buying patterns, but it also works not just on an individual basis, but your marketing in general. You, know, you go through a loop and you say, well, this didn't work out that well, next time we try this. And you keep going with that. So you can build on your market, marketing, you can always be learning. Okay, 
So that brings us to the KPIs. Um, KPIs are super important. And I've stepped in as a consultant to many companies and have always seen, uh, have often seen, they're not establishing KPIs. And it sounds ridiculous because they're spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on certain campaigns and they have no way to judge whether or not that is actually doing well. So KPIs are super important. It's, it's, very, it's very interesting to see that people don't, don't actually establish that. Um, but KPIs should be established before starting a project. You figure out what your goals are, and then what would be the indicator that that goal is actually being achieved in your marketing. You don't want to start a project and then say, Oh, well, my open rate is doing well. I'm going to use that as the benchmark for all other campaigns. And that's what a lot of times people do. But you really should be flexible when you put together your marketing and, and decide what your KPIs are. And a great example of this is the Apple privacy update. A lot of, a lot of users, especially uh, B2C, uh, at least email broadcasters, will depend on that open rate to benchmark how they're doing and <clears throat> you know and then, then there can always be like things thrown into them and things have things change platforms change best practices change privacy updates happen and then what do you do and i think this is a really important topic right now to, to be talking about not just because of the apple privacy update but because privacy is the way everyone's going and this is going to be across platforms in the future. And you really have to be flexible in how you're handling your KPIs to be able to handle that. So just from my experience, the, thing, the couple things that I was able to do for the Apple Privacy Update, one is I was able to highlight and segment out the people that I believe are Apple users. And I still continue to send them the broadcasts but I send it separately so that I still have open rates for everyone else. But this will only be good until other platforms update their privacy uh, requirements. And <clears throat> another great way to, to even think about this is um, to start before that becomes a problem. Uh, one thing that I do is I use a lot of behavioral engagement to be able to, to remarket to people exactly what they want to hear, the messaging, the timing, all of that. And what you know, you can do surveys, that's a really great way to understand the customer and what they want to hear, when they want to hear it. But I like things that are fun engagements like contests and how they engage with different uh, products and then use that to remarket to them. And this can help with your Apple privacy update and other, other updates as they come. Okay, so the concluding statements. Uh, behavioral economics is the study of decision making and it gives marketers a cutting edge to understand their consumers. Uh, dual process theory is this idea that humans think in one or two different ways. They either think very fast and major reactions or they think really in depth and they're comparing their, their products and the options out there. So another thing that I talked about was the marketing funnel became the customer journey. And I, I used the loop framework. And I think that's a really great way to, to build on your customer journey going forward. And then the last really big concluding statement is uh, KPIs are super important and you're marketing follow your customer journey everything will only be as good as your data is all right does anybody have any questions before we break for lunch go ahead i think i can be loud enough um yeah so yeah you're good a lot of times my with my company uh we have um technical content for like startup software companies and so forth. And a lot of times I'm head of sales and uh, I'm head of sales and I do all the discovery and um, proposals 
And a lot of times, you know, I'm trying to uncover their KPIs and they're like, yeah, I'm not sure. And I really have to dig in to try and get them to give me one. And, you know, they'll give me something broad like revenue. And I'm like, well, it, like how much revenue and what amount of time and like, how do we base, you know, how do we judge your success with our partnership? So I don't know if you have any suggestions on how to, um, with KPIs being so important, how do you get that out of people? Well, I think first you have to start with the goal, figure out what their goal is, and then talk to them about different ways to measure that goal. And um, different benchmarks along that process too. Like revenue is great, but it's there might be a problem upstream. And I think that that's really important in explaining that, that you want to address any problems upstream so that people don't fall out of the problems world. Yeah. Toss that box. <laughs> and coordination is not my thing. Um, I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. Um, how many touches do you typically need to see both with um, the system one and system two before somebody is convinced to buy? Well, so it's going to be different for everything. You know, for example, the customers that I talked about, people walk in, they see it, put it in their basket, and they walk out with it. And that's one touch, that's it. So, and it's going to be different for, for each of them. Um, it's going to be different for what, what products, especially different based on price points. And most people don't walk into like a car dealership and just, okay, I, I see it and I walk out with it. Some people do. Um, it depends who your target customer is and, and what your product is. Um, and then my next question is, we are in a unique situation where we actually want to reach both personas and both type of thinkers um, at all times. <laughs> We're constantly trying to build up new audiences while being um, cognizant of our loyal audience and making sure we're reaching them as well. Are those just two separate campaigns to be run simultaneously? Is there a way to merge them? Okay, so I would say, you, so first you gotta break it down by personas. And then decide where along the, the customer journey is the best place to switch them. I wouldn't recommend trying to, to do both at the same time to everybody. Uh, it's kind of like a broadcast net type of way of doing it, whereas uh, using the customer journey, breaking it down to personas, and then deciding when you want them in system one, system two, uh, and then structuring your campaigns around that. Any other questions?